Okay, great. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Does that sound okay, Liz? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thanks folks for um, attending uh, uh, this talk uh, on your evening. Um, we have a nice group together. Um, and apologies for the delay. This was obviously supposed to be last week, but we had tornadoes ripping through town and I thought it might not be um, the best if I was giving you this presentation and talking to you from my bathtub with a bike helmet on, which was not the most fun. Um, so I have a presentation, but I was curious just to start and I don't know if people can use the reaction buttons maybe just to show a sort of show of hands or a thumbs up of how many people actually have um, have cactus or succulents, cactus and succulent plants at home and or sort of identify themselves as hobbyists or collectors, whether really seriously or, you know, just starting out or pretty novice. Okay, got some. Okay, good, a good number. Um, that's helpful for me because what I really wanna do tonight is keep things pretty conversational and focus on actually some of the nuts and bolts of the basics of cactus and succulent trade and in particular regulation and what it means to even talk about the existence of say an illegal um, cactus trade. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and so hopefully that will be of interest to you and that's why you're here. If you are already an international expert in say CITES regulations, this, uh, uh, hopefully we can at least get into some 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 deeper conversation in the Q and A, but some of this information might be um, a, might be well familiar to you. Um, so let me go ahead and just get this going. Okay, Liz, this is not sharing. No, it is. You can see the you can see the first slide. Yeah. Oh, okay, excellent. Maybe Great. Maybe bigger if you can. But oh, bigger. Okay, interesting. Hold on. Let me. Sorry. Let me find out why this is not. Uh huh. That's why. Okay. How about now? That looks good. Great. Okay. So the, the title I gave my presentation for today is, Is My Cactus Illegal? Demystifying the World of Illegal Trade in Cacti and Succulents. And I really want to focus in on this question that some people might be asking themselves. Oh, I'm getting really interested in cactus and succulents and um, getting more interested in potentially more rare plants and um, keeping them either in a greenhouse or in a, on a windowsill. Um, is it possible that you are in possession of something illegal? Um, and we're gonna kind of break down that question and try to understand it um, in the sort of uh, kinds of nuances that go into understanding forms of illegal or illicit trade in plants and why there is an illicit or illegal trade in plants to begin with in the context of cactus and succulent plants. So in terms of just the, the broad kind of topics that we're gonna to cover tonight, why an illegal trade in cactus and succulent plants exists, some of the challenges to combating these trades globally, um, some key things to look out for in acquiring plants for yourself and or with your friends, um, to think about sustainability of these plant trades and where plants are coming from. And um, I'll try to intersperse this with some examples from, from some of my ongoing research. And I guess maybe just um, before I advance further to say, that um, I um, have been doing research on human wildlife relations writ large for a long time as part of my dissertation research. Um, I've been focusing on illegal cactus and succulent plant trades globally for the last three or four years or so now. And I'm currently writing a book on the topic, which is still under development. So I can't uh, tell you where to go buy it yet. It's gonna be another couple of years. Um, and I became really, really fascinated in this topic of um, cactus and succulent illegal trade. One, because until I started doing the research on it, I wasn't aware that such a thing even existed. So you might fall into that camp as well. Um, 
And I was very curious to learn more about what it means to have an illegal trade in these plants. And um, one, what are some of the regulatory issues that that presents? And what can people who care about taking care of plants like these and their conservation um, do about it? And what kinds of information should people be aware of? So that's just a few of the reasons why I got interested in this topic in the first place. Let's see, okay. So just to start um, from a, a baseline, um, and I really am gonna be focusing not only on cacti tonight, but a lot of my top discussion will be about cactus plants um, this evening. Um, the, across the cactus taxonomic group, about a third of all cactus species are now listed as threatened within the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List program. So this is the program um, that, that classifies how endangered certain species might be from near threatened to critically endangered to extinct. Okay. This makes, and this is, from, this is from the paper that this was published on in 2015 by um, Dr. Barbara Getch and her many colleagues. Um, and this makes the cactus family of plants one of the top five most threatened taxonomic groups of plants or animals on the planet. So there's reason for concern about the conservation and long-term conservation of these species globally. Importantly, and I have it highlighted here on this slide, and this is part of why we're gonna be talking about what we're talking about tonight, is that the dominant drivers of extinction risks in part um, are related to what is referred to in this article as the unscrup unscrupulous collection of live plants and seeds for horticulture trade in private ornamental collections. In other words, a significant reason that many of these plants may be going and being driven towards extinction relates to their collection and trade by the horticultural and private collector community. Okay. So this should signal to us that there is a serious issue that we need to contend with in terms of the conservation of these species and how their conservation is being affected, seemingly ironically, by people who are very, very passionate about them. And so for me, um, this was a, is an important in, uh, important issue that requires intervention in terms of thinking about how is it that we can ensure the conservation of these species and intervene within communities of people who care about these species, right? Um, so um, that's just to give us a little bit of a, some background. And so some of the ways that I'm, uh, and we can get into this more in the Q&A, but I'll be curious to see how people have come across discussions of illegal cactus and succulent trade but some of the examples that people might be familiar with might be ones like this. Um, this was an article from The Guardian talking about how um, cactus theft was, is ravaging the American desert. And here we see an image of a National Park Service ranger um, adding a microchip um, into a saguaro cactus um, as just one example. So saguaro poaching in, um, uh, the, in the US Southwest as one example of a form of illegal cactus trade. Or people might have seen a number of different articles that have come out over the last few years relating to a number of other kinds of cactus and succulent thefts. Um, be that the Dudley Afarinosis that you see depicted here in the case of the stolen succulents as NPR called it, or an article from the Atlantic in 2016 about busting cactus smugglers in the American West. Um, so, the, it, see, it would seem that there's been this increasing focus in the media on what would appear to be a rise in illegal cactus trades. But in fact, what we really know is this is a lot of these processes and dynamics are nothing new and they've been happening for a very, very long time. In part, what has changed over time is the sort of regulatory responses to managing these kinds of trade, which is to say, determining what it is that actually makes these particular kinds of practices illegal in the first place, okay? Just to situate us a little bit more in terms of thinking about the sort of richness and biodiversity of these species, this is just focused on the family of um, cactaceae or, or cactus plants here. Um, the, the, the figure on the left is just showing you the proportion of species um, that are threatened um, based on that assessment by um, Barbara Getch and her colleagues. And then the figure on the right is showing you total biodiversity 
of within the cactus family writ large. And so these are, um, you know, uh, new world plants, and we can see that biodiversity in particular has a number of hot spots for the cactus family. In particular, Mexico, the U.S. Southwest, um, the states of uh, Minas Gerais and Bahia and Brazil, and also in, uh, for instance, Chile. Moving into really talking about what it is that we're talking about when we talk about illegality in these plants, I want to start by saying that in effect, more or less, there's really no such thing as an illegal cactus or an illegal succulent. So if you're sitting at home and fretting over if suddenly you might have an illegal plant, um, fear not. <laughs> there's not really anything innate that makes a plant illegal per se, right? The one exception to this being, at least within the context of the United States, um, Lafafara Williamsii, also known as peyote, which is also classed as a schedule one drug. Um, which has exemptions if you're part of the Navajo um, church. Um, but otherwise, what we wanna focus in on is the fact that what makes a succulent or cactus illegal, most commonly in terms of how it's referred to in the news, but also in policy, refers to its international trade, okay? So this is in, in relationship to um, how trade is regulated by something that is known as the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, um, a very long title that um, is known as CITES for short, okay? So what we should say with a little bit more nuance is that there are illegal trades in cactus and succulent plants, but this is not to say the same thing as saying that there are illegal plants. Okay, so this is an important distinction and I think it'll help us kind of unpack what it means to talk about illegal trade in cactus and succulent plants as we get a little bit more into the weeds here, which is what we're going to do now. So apologies if you weren't here, you, were, you weren't coming on this evening to attend um, a policy and regulatory talk, but I think it's actually really important information that more people um, who collect plants and should be aware of, even if you aren't someone who's going online and buying inter plants internationally, say off of eBay, okay? So CITES is managed by um, the UN Environment Program as the agreement between governments with the aim to ensure that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of the species, okay? So CITES does not only apply to plants, it applies to animals. And in fact, many of the sort of rules were really developed around regulating animal trade. It, um, the, the origins of it date back to the mid 1960s, but CITES um, formally entered into force in 1975. And CITES is primarily made up of three different appendices, which I think it's good for people to be aware of. And it's also a place where people get really confused oftentimes for very reasonable reasons. Um, the important thing to know starting in talk, to talk about CITES is that CITES is concerned with international trade, okay? CITES is not concerned about trade within particular countries, okay? So when we talk about international or illegal um, cactus and succulent trade, and we're talking about it within the context of breaking the CITES convention, we are only talking about this in the context of international trade. So if I buy a plant that um, is being shipped to me from Mexico or Brazil or Chile or the United Kingdom or the Ukraine, for instance, okay? Um, if I'm purchasing a plant from Florida, then CITES has no purview over that transaction, okay? A lot of text, it's the only text slide I have with a bunch of text on it, <laughs> and uh, we'll move on. Um, the three appendices are really important, I think, for people to be, um, to be aware of, and it's a place that a lot of times people, I think, also get quite confused. Um, so starting at the sort of most strict and most controlled appendix, these are appendix one species, so for our purposes, we could just talk about appendix one plants, okay? Um, so this includes species that are threatened with extinction and provides the greatest level of protection which includes restrictions on commercial trade, okay? Um, in general, this means that trade in these species is only permitted in very exceptional circumstances, most commonly in terms of research-related trade. In practice, what this effectively means is that if you um, see a CITES-1 listed plant, 
being sold internationally, that international sale is more likely than not going to be um, occurring illegally because in order for that trade to happen, you need CITES permits, which are permits that are granted in terms of their import and export. Um, and, the, and those permits would not be forthcoming from a government, okay? Um, so Appendix 2 is gonna be the, probably the most um, important appendix for people to be thinking about in terms of acquiring plants internationally um, in relationship to their trade. So Appendix 2 includes species that, although they're not currently threatened with extinction, may become so without trade controls, okay? Um, this can also include species that actually look like other species that they're concerned might be affected by trade, so it's a little bit complicated. But importantly, you can see there's only 931 species that are currently listed as Appendix 1 species on CITES. Compare this to around 35,000 on Appendix 2. All, importantly, for the purposes of our talk tonight, all cacti, the entire family of Cactaceae, are CITES Appendix 2 listed plants, except for those that are Appendix 1. So what this means is that if you are purchasing a cactus, any kind of cactus, barring a couple of exam, um, exemptions, um, internationally or selling internationally, um, you would need to have a CITES appendix, you would need to have CITES paperwork to import or export that plant. Um, and if that plant was appendix one, you wouldn't be able to get that paperwork at all. Um, I don't actually think it's really worth getting too into the weeds about what Appendix 3 is because it's quite specific um, and doesn't really affect how people may or may not actually be purchasing plants or buying them. Um, I realize that this is probably this might still be a pretty confusing thing, so I'm very happy to kind of come back to this or get more into the weeds with it um, in the Q&A section. But the important things I think people should be aware of is effectively Appendix 1 plants are plants that are not going to be available in commercial trade legally. And Appendix 2 are plants that require some kind of certifi certification and permits for their trade internationally. Okay. Just to give you some examples of some cacti that fall into that Appendix 1 category, in general, these are cacti that are recognized as um, already endangered in habitat. And in theory, it is believed that should they be traded, that trade would negatively affect their overall con conservation status. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, any species of cactus in the Strombocactus genus, any species in the Turbinocarpus or Ubelmania genus, um, and then there's a couple of species that are um, actually listed at the species level rather than the genus, and this includes um, Astrophytum asterius and Aztecium ridderi. So what I want to do now with a little bit of our time is give you some practical examples of how you might confront questions and ambiguities and concerns about encountering quote unquote illegal cacti, okay? Um, which is to say encountering the possibility of illegal international trade. So I just pulled this screenshot um, two days ago, I think, or I guess it was last week um, by going on eBay. An important thing to know about the illegal trade in cactus and succulent plants is there's not a secret dark web market for these species. These are illegal trades that are happening out in the open um, on sites like eBay and Etsy and increasingly on Instagram. Um, this is one of the driving concerns around these trades right now and how easy it is for plants to move around the world very, very quickly from country to country. And it's incredibly difficult from a regulatory perspective for regulatory agencies to regulate that many different kinds of trades coming from all over the world oftentimes with people taking a plant, throwing it in a box, taking it to the local post office and shipping it to the other side of the world, okay? So here's a practical example though. As I mentioned on the previous slide, Aztecium ritteri is an appendix one listed CITES plant. This means that this plant effectively can't be is not gonna be traded and illegally has no international trade. So I stuck Aztecium ritteri in eBay to see what I could pull up and this was the first plant I came across that I was most intrigued by as having some signals of potential concern. And so I want to I want to show them to you so that after our talk, you have a sense of things that you might look out for as well, and that you can also tell other people about. First of all, 
I'm very intrigued by this comment about it being on its own route, okay? So these are very, very slow growing plants. And the fact that it's being advertised as being on its own route tells us something about its age, okay? So rather than being a grafted plant where a cactus might be added, grafted onto a rootstock, this is a plant that the owner, that the seller is telling us is, was effectively grown from seed and is of this particular size. So that tells me something about how old the plant might already be. Another thing I'm paying attention to is the price. The price is pretty elevated for a plant that's about the size of, um, at this stage, maybe an inch wide, okay? This is a very small cactus. Um, uh, this tells us something about its desirability and the potential that this in fact might have been a wild collected plant. I can't say that with any assuredness from looking at this um, photo alone, but it's a signal that it might well be the case. The other thing that I'm paying attention to is the overall feature and form of the plant and the kinds of characteristics it has. Note, for instance, that it looks like it has some brown spots and some sort of um, issue happening in the sort of lower right part of the plant. These are all signals and signs that the plant may have experienced um, periods of stress in its life, which are also signals that the plant may have come from the wild, okay? The other things that I'm paying attention to in looking at this um, screenshot is where the plant is coming from. In, per, in, per, in particular, I'm noticing that the location of this plant is coming from Ukraine, okay? Now, Aztecia murderi is um, most certainly not a species of cactus that grows natively in Ukraine. Um, and so I'm already immediately wondering whether or not this plant, um, how this plant, um, one, arrived in a place like Ukraine, um, and secondly, how it could be legally sold from the Ukraine to say the United States, because it says that this plant can be shipped worldwide, okay? And in particular, in a, a true giveaway that you should probably avoid looking at a purchase like this, I find this screenshot or this, this language below the plant on eBay. It says, we do not supply phytosanitary control documents. If you have a risk with this product, please do not buy. Okay, sending to all countries of the world, et cetera. I'll leave um, uh, it at that. What this is signaling to us as a potential buyer is one, that the buyer, the seller is very happy to send it wherever they want, wherever you wanted them to, but they are not liable um, if, for instance, um, the plan is intercepted and you are held responsible for its purchase as the buyer. Um, they mentioned that it does not come with phytosanitary control documents, but what's implicit in that statement is that the, the, the plan is also not coming with CITES export permits or import permits. And the reason it's not is because this is an Appendix 1 listed plant, so there are no permits available for it. Uh, those permits are not forthcoming. It would be illegal to sell this plant. This is unambiguously a plant that is being sold potentially if you were to purchase it from the United States, this would represent an illegal um, trade, okay? I wanna give one more example um, because it presents even more potential ambiguity. And I, and I wanna pay attention to that ambiguity because I wanna make people feel comfortable recognizing that this is a really complicated issue. And it's not always clear whether something is above board and perfectly legal and acceptable or ethical, uh, or whether it maybe is not so much or maybe is illegal, okay? So here's an interesting example where we have an Ubelmania pectinifera, okay? This is the Ubelmania genus is listed also as Appendix 1 on CITES. So again, permits are not, um, you can't get permits for this plant. And the um, description says, Ubamania pectinifera on own roots, hard grown, beautiful specimen, Brazil cactus. Now looking at this plant, it's probably pretty obvious to people that this does not look like a plant that was just normally grown in a, in a cultivated greenhouse or in a windowsill, okay? It has this predominant corking. This is that, this look of that harder gray color at the bottom of the plant. It has different sort of coloration. It looks like it's, we might say that the plant looks like it's lived a little bit. And this is what the, um, the seller is trying to communicate by calling it hard grown. This is a technique that um, certain uh, cultivators of plants will use to try to grow plants in a way that mimics how they would look if they were growing out in the wild. So this seller is saying, 
this, I wanted to grow this plant to look as wild as possible, okay? Because this is what Ubomania pectinifera would basically look like as a wild plant in its native habitat of Brazil. Um, this presents some problems for us as a potential would-be buyer in terms of asking, is this potentially also a stolen wild grown plant? Or was this grown from seed in the United States? Um, it's just grown in this particular hard grown look. So a couple of things that we might wanna look at. One, it's being shipped from the United States. And if we're here in the US, there's no CITES paperwork that's required. So there's not a question about its legality if you were purchasing it from the United States. That being said, if you were purchasing it from outside the United States, this plant you would not be able to, um, to buy. But notice that the seller also says they're only shipping to the United States. So they're already signaling that they're not interested in being engaged in, in a legal trade of this species. This plant's a pretty difficult one though, because it really does look like a, a plant that might have been um, uh, picked out of the wild and transported to the United States at some point and then is being sold on. It's also quite expensive, which does indicate to us that this is a very old plant that seemed to be worth a lot of money by this collector. This is a plant where theoretically it could be grown from a seed and be perfectly ethical to purchase more or less, although we would have to ask when the seed arrived in the United States, which is a sort of different question, um, but it also might not be. And so this might be an interesting case for you to say, do I really need to buy this really expensive old plant that may or may not have been um, illegally taken from the wild? Or maybe I should just get some seeds of this species and just grow it myself and watch it grow slowly over time. I already just mentioned seeds and I just wanna leave one kind of comment about seeds because seeds represent an even more challenging and complicated problem in the topic of illegal trade. In general, seeds are not included on CITES. So it means that it's much easier and legal to purchase cactus and succulent seeds um, internationally um, and germinate them yourself. However, people should be aware that all Mexican cactus seeds are also listed on CITES Appendix 2, meaning that even to purchase the seeds of Mexican cacti internationally requires import and export permits. This is something that a lot of people aren't aware of, uh, but it's important for people to know. Um, with that said, you will find very easily Mexican cactus seeds being sold from all over the world. So this admittedly produces a very confusing regulatory market and set of problems for folks as consumers of these of, of seeds and plants. Something that just um, was developed, and I did not develop this, this was produced um, by um, some great folks. I have their um, information down here. Um, that might be a really useful resource for some people to take a look at is a new website called ethicalcactus.com. And this is a pr product of some really um, just some, in, uh, some folks who really wanna help people better understand information about legal and illegal cactus trade and what they refer to as ethical collections and trade. Um, so this is a resource that I would certainly encourage people to check out. Um, it has some recommendations similar to the ones I just described in terms of what to look for when you're looking for plants potentially online. Um, because it is in the online environment, especially on social media platforms that we're seeing so much of this illegal trade, but also recommendations for just thinking about growing your own um, plants themselves. Although I do encourage people to also think about where they're purchasing seeds from as well, um, because there are certain species of plants where seed is also being over collected and could negatively impact the species. So here are some very practical things that I think people should be aware of and can do. When you are buying and purchasing plants, you can ask questions about where they came from, whether it is asking Liz over at Bee Willow um, or asking um, plant purveyors online. And if they are people who are also concerned about the conservation of these species, they should be able to tell you about where their stock comes from and whether or not these are cultivated plants. Because what we find right now is a lot of these online marketplaces like eBay, Instagram, and Etsy are not doing a good job of regulating this. Um, and part of that's just because of how difficult and challenging it is to do. But also I think in part, it relates to the fact that when people think about illegal wildlife trade, people aren't usually thinking about illegal plant trade. In general, just be wary when purchasing online and be very wary when um, thinking about purchasing online internationally. Um, we didn't get into other succulents um, today, but 
a lot of those are species that may or may not even be listed on CITES, but you should also be paying attention to things about where they may have come from. And at the end of the day, if a plant looks suspicious to you, maybe just don't buy it or at least ask important questions. Um, and the other thing I would add to this is, I think it's important to think beyond matters of legality and illegality. What does it mean to also just think about conscientious and sustainable purchasing and plant care? What is it that you're actually looking for in acquiring a new plant? And what are the ways that in acquiring that plant you might do so in ways that, that most minimizes potential harms to the environment or plants in wild habitat? Um, so with that, I think I will wrap up sort of my talking portion of um, the presentation today and maybe open it up instead for some conversation and question and answer. I do have more slides about particular forms of illegal trade. So if people don't have questions, I'm happy to get into that. But I had a feeling that people might wanna have um, a bit of a QA. and um, This is just some acknowledgements and also details about where you can um, find me. But with that, I, oh, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and maybe um, we could entertain some questions if there are any. Are there questions? Yeah, it looks like there was one question in the chat um, from Lauren. She wanted to know how often CITES appendices, appendices are updated, um, in particular, the first one. Sorry, can you say that one more time, Ashley? Oh, I'm sorry. No, um, it's not your fault. Let me turn up my volume. So Lauren wanted to know how often CITES appendices are updated, in particular, the first one. Oh, that's a really good question. So um, in something I didn't, I realized I didn't say about CITES is individual countries are um, party to CITES. So um, uh, in within each country, um, countries will have a management authority as well as a scientific authority. Um, so when CITES um, um, have the conference of the parties, different individual countries will um, make proposed amendments to, for instance, both uplist and also downlist species um, um, from these from these listings. Um, does that help answer that question? So it's a it's a practice of negotiation, and um, people have to. So then the, the parties will vote, for instance, on whether to uplist or downlist these plants. One thing I didn't sort of say is a bit of a critique about CITES is one way I sort of think about CITES is it is a very well intended mechanism. Um, working within a very difficult environment, and especially in the context of plants, there are a lot of ways that CITES leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and part of that has to do with the process by which plants are uplisted or downlisted in the sense that um, a lot of species are listed on CITES that aren't necessarily actually impacted by trade because it's not required to do any kind of formal assessment of the potential impact of those trades on species before they get listed to CITES. And so that can produce some issues as well in terms of which plants and species get listed and which don't. And we have another question from David. He wants mm -hmm. to know if trends in particular species um, kind of ebb and flow, and if so, what can trigger them? That's a really, really good question, David. Um, there are absolutely trends in trade of particular species that come and go over time. What triggers them is another interesting question and one that I don't know how well I'll be able to answer here. I'll give an example though. Um, right now, especially over the last five years or so, we've seen just a really growing intense interest in mesem family plants which would be succulents that are in like, say the conophytum and lithops family. These are plants that are really cute and really small. And they mostly come from South Africa and Namibia. And they've become incredibly popular amongst hobbyists and collectors in a number of different East Asian countries in particular. Um, there's nothing new about them. They've been around obviously for you know, thousands of years to say the least. What specifically has made them so popular in the current moment is a difficult question to answer. Um, I think like any kinds of fashion and trends, we see these kinds of tr trends and fashions come and go. 
Um, cacti aesthetically were incredibly fashionable species in the 1960s and 70s. And we saw a general decline in their popularity in the 80s and 90s, and then a real resurgence of their popularity globally in the 2000s into the late, you know, into the present. Um, I think social media has dramatically accelerated the rate by which those trends move. Um, this is probably something that Liz and Ashley can almost speak to more than me. Um, they probably have much more of a sense of, of this, but um, people sharing photographs and ideas and new plants and new species can so quickly spread within particular cultures. We've seen this with the aeroid boom, you know, um, the fact that you have people paying literally thousands of dollars for cuttings of a Monstera alba, very, you know, variegated Monstera is both extraordinary and insane, especially given the context that in a few years, these plants will be available everywhere for a couple of bucks effectively. But nevertheless, people like to have what's fashionable in that particular moment. But so yeah, no, absolutely, we see these trends. It's the same in terms of the research I've been doing for the last couple of years on the growing trend in desire for Dudleyas and Dudleya farinosa and Dudleya pacophytum um, in Korea and China, um, but globally as well. And that's something where, again, these plants are nothing new. And in fact, um, uh, interviews I did in California showed that greenhouse growers and commercial growers in California had more or less stopped offering the sale of Dudleya farinosa as a plant um, because people didn't really want it. And then we suddenly just saw this boom in desire for these species um, in certain regions of the world, but not in others. And you know that that's where that issue of aesthetics, but also psychology really comes into play. Which is why I'm writing a book because it's long and complicated. <laughs> we have another question. Um, Pamela wants to know um, in regards to other plants, are they equally um, do they equally have the same problems as cacti do as far as like seeds, purchasing seeds mm. and things like that are concerned? Certainly cactus and succulent plants are not alone. Um, Pamela, I did see your, your comment and I can't speak specifically um, to that um, plant because I'm actually not familiar, very familiar with it. But certainly this is an issue that's not exclusive to the cactus family. Um, cycads are another ancient family of plant that are also one of the most threatened taxon on the planet, animal or plant. Um, we see, you know, of course the orchid trade is pretty famous and familiar to people. We see a lot of rare orchid trade being a really serious problem. That's certainly nothing new. So certainly this is not unique to the world of cactus and succulent plants. I've come to really focus on it in my work because I saw a real opening to do some meaningful research on it. Um, because uh, there just wasn't a lot of social research on the subject. Um, Tracy wants to know if it's safe to assume that purchasing plants from local garden stores is okay. Like, do they follow yeah. society's protocols? Or are they registered yeah. and all of that? In general, my um, the general advice I give people is buying locally in general is gonna save you a lot of trouble with this and certainly buying from more common local garden stores or your local um, greenhouse or nursery. Um, unless you're going to a really specialist nursery, you are far, far less likely to encounter problems around CITES and international trade. Most people who are selling in the commercial um, context are going to be selling cultivated plants that um, do not, where you're not going to have to contend with CITES. And again, CITES is also, you know, a lot of these species that are applicable are going to be more, um, some of the more rare species as well. Um, obviously, the entire cactus family is listed on Appendix 2, but if you're buying, you know, um, a cactus, a pretty common cactus that's cultivated and grown in the United States, and you're buying at a local garden store, you don't have to worry about this kind of issue. And I think that's an important point because so we're not trying to paralyze people, right? In learning about illegal trades, we don't want people to suddenly think that they shouldn't be purchasing plants and can't have plants. That's certainly not the point. I personally have a question. Great. Um, I was wondering, do some of the discrepancies between CITES and the Lacey Act and other um, like wildlife uh, trade and 
things like of that nature. Do some of the discrepancies come just simply from like defining the term wildlife? Yeah, yeah, absolutely great question, Ashley. Um, yes, and, um, and maybe you'd be able to speak to this better than I can, but something that we've seen over time is that the definition of wildlife in a regulatory context has changed. The Lacey Act, okay, really important piece of legislation to the United States in terms of interstate um, movement and sale of endangered species, right? Um, because the Lacey Act doesn't just apply internationally, the Lacey Act applies within the United States and it becomes a federal issue and a federal offense if you cross state lines. The Lacey Act did not effectively include plants in its original forms and eventually was um, uh, edited and amended to be inclusive of um, some plant life, but it was also still restricted in where it applied. So for instance, just by way of example, the Endangered Species Act, the mo arguably the most powerful piece of legislation for protecting species in the United States and arguably one of the most powerful pieces of, enda of endangered species legislation in the world. Um, when it comes to plants that are listed on the Endangered Species Act, the Endangered Species Act is really only applied to federal lands in terms of if you were to take a plant that's on that endangered species list, um, it would require that you took it from public lands for you to be in violation of the Endangered Species Act. That is not the case for animals. So we do see important differences in how animal and plant life are treated and how those definitions have evolved over time. That's a great question. It's also really complicated, like a lot of this stuff, right? It's really complicated. Your question. It doesn't look like we have any other questions, but Elizabeth would really like to see the other illegal trading methods um, from your other slides because she is an AP environmental teacher. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm happy to do that if there aren't other questions. Um, does that sound like a, a, a plan? I can try to move through these quickly. Um, sure. Let me... What I'll focus on, I think, is the case of Dudley of Farinosa that grows along the whole spine of the California coast and up into Oregon. Um, to the untrained eye, it can sort of just look like what a lot of us think a succulent looks like. It is plump and uh, kind of rosette shaped, sort of looks like an echeveria. A lot of plants that used to be labeled as echeverias have been moved into the Dudleya genus, so there's some relationships there. But starting a few years ago, really in 2016, 2017, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife increasingly became aware of a problem of people taking large, large quantities, I mean thousands of plants of Dudleya farinosa in one go, and they were being shipped uh, it appeared that they were being shipped internationally, and in particular, that they were being shipped to um, South Korea, okay? And it led to this very concerning scenario where large, very old plants, this Dudley of Farinosa plant is easily at least 40, 50, 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, they're also known as live forevers, part because they live a very long time. We're showing up on Korean plant website marketplaces for thousands of dollars a piece. Okay, so this is an image of a, that I, of a screenshot I took from one of these Korean marketplaces um, where a Dudley of Farinosa plant was showing up for 4, 000, over $4,000 for sale. Unambiguously a wild harvested plant from California that had been illegally transported to Korea. What I became really interested in after spending, so I was doing interviews up and down the California coastline with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, law enforcement officers, botanists, conservationists. And what I came to find, and also in terms of reading media articles and media reports about this, was that there were a couple of key prominent hypotheses about what was driving this illicit Dudley of Farinosa trade. Because something that's really important to understand about it is this is not a CITES listed plant. 
Okay, so this is a very different example than the ones I was giving before. Dudley afarinosa is not an endangered species and it is not regulated under international trade by CITES, okay? So there was nothing stopping people from legally purchasing Dudley afarinosa from greenhouses in the United States or seeds and legally shipping them with phytosanitary permits back to South Korea or alternatively, then growing them from seed in South Korea. There was nothing to stop people from purchasing seeds online of Dudley afarinosa, growing them up in South Korea and selling them wherever they wanted to. Nothing legally stopping them from doing that. So it was very concerning to see um, from law enforcement's perspective, thousands of these wild plants of Dudley afarinosa being um, kind of ripped out of their habitat and ending up on the other side of the world. And there were two prominent hypotheses that people had for why this was happening. The first was that there was just this increasing popularity of succulent plants in mainstream South Korean and East Asian cultures writ large. This kind of points to the comment that the question that David had earlier, where he was asking about how these sort of fads arise. There was a general sense that like a lot of places in the world, including the United States, that there was a sort of succulent um, fever is what people were calling it, that had sort of taken hold and was sweeping um, South Korean culture. And people were really obsessed with succulents and people really, really wanted to have them. And that an unfortunate consequence of this was that Dudley Afarinosa was swept up in this too. And people saw an opportunity to make a quick buck by just stealing the plants and shipping them off and selling them. The second hypothesis was that rather than it just sort of being this mainstream fad that you know, thousands of people in South Korea wanted a Dudley Afarinosa, was that these plants were desired because they came from the wild. That rather than desiring cultivated Dudley Afarinosa plants, that South Korean and East Asian succulent consumers specifically wanted these plants from California because they had a particular look and shape that only could um, develop when plants were grown in the wild. So these were two sort of competing hypotheses. And confusingly, I often heard them said at the same time. Um, what I ended up deciding to do from a research perspective was combine and, um, sorry, um, capture as many sort of news articles as I could find that were coming out about this story. And also with my interviews, looking at sort of different framing narratives that people were using for talking about where this trade was coming from. And I ultimately sort of settled on three major frames. One was the basic profit frame that people saw a cheap, easy opportunity to make a quick dollar by stealing plants. So taking a resource for free and then selling it on to someone else. So money being the first frame. The second was this frame I mentioned about valuing wild species and that um, something about Asian succulent consumer culture preferentially meant people wanted wild plants. And then the third was this pop culture framing. Um, and I took this, this title um, from a newspaper clipping I found, which referred to the sort of growing frenzy for succulents by housewives and hipsters in South Korea. And so here are some examples of some news clips that kind of give you a sense of these narratives um, working in the world. Um, so one is uh, this one at top where it's talking about um, the Chinese middle class and how it has this huge and growing buying cloud and has this impact on many wild species from rhino, from elephants to rhino horns to pangolins and sharks. So here you see this narrative that there's something about wild products that East Asian consumer culture really values. And so this was being used as a way to understand this new trade in Dudley Afarinosa. Um, here, this middle one, we see this argument about sort of harassed housewives and Generation Z hipsters desiring um, these plants and with all things Korean, um, uh, the most populous nation in the world had caught a massive dose of Dudley a fever. So here the idea is that these plants were really popular in Korea and as a result, um, Chinese consumers wanted them. Um, and that's just to sort of give you an example. I'm gonna sort of skip over the sort of scientific nitty gritty of this. I ended up writing a paper on this topic to sort of unpack these narratives because what I actually found is that I don't think a lot of these narratives really hold up. So here in this study, I showed how news media outlets characterized all these different reasons why people wanted and um, desired to buy these plants. Um, from spiritual well being, because people argued because they were in the shape of a lotus flower, they were seen as auspicious, to as an investment, to purportedly having medicinal value, which is not true, 
Um, but what I actually found is I ultimately went to Korea for a month to do research and do in-depth interviews with um, um, succulent uh, greenhouse growers and collectors and consumer um, purchasers to understand why they wanted them. And what I heard were very, very different reasons. And what I found when I went to some, South Korea was some of the most extraordinary collections of succulents I've ever seen in all of my research um, by some of the most well-skilled and incredibly passionate growers of succulents. Um, and what I ultimately came to find was that this desire for unfortunate consequence is that these plants did become very, very desirable, um, but the desire was not only confined to South Korea, South Koreans are well regarded, especially across East Asia, as being some of the best growers and skillful growers of succulent plants. Um, these are just some examples of um, some people's private collections um, that I got to visit. And so there was a high demand for purchasing succulents from Korean growers across East Asia and also beyond. I met European grower um, consumers who also, for instance, purchase Korean succulents and American consumers who also purchase Korean succulents. Um, the reason that these plants primarily have been getting stolen out of habitat is how long it takes to grow them up to a size that certain specialist consumers really want. And so what we really see here is this disjuncture between the time of these plants and how long it takes them to grow to a certain size and the availability of these plants on the market. So I met many, many growers of these plants in Korea who are legally growing Dudleya farinosa and a number of other Dudleya species and they are happy to make them available to people who want to buy them. It's just that there's a smaller, really passionate and hardcore set of consumers who didn't want to buy smaller plants and sort of wait and watch them grow. They wanted these big shower year pieces and they wanted them now. And that's what's really led to this. I also think that because of the number of people growing these plants now, that this particular trade is actually diminishing and declining. But it tells us something very important about fads and how quickly they can rise and how that cuts across the problem of how slow growing many of these species that people care about really are. That's just another photo of some of these Dudleyas um, from Korea. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Did I stop sharing my screen? Great. So I hope that was, um, I forget who asked that question, but I hope that was interesting <laughs> or useful. Awesome. Well, Jared, thank you so, so much. And Ashley, thank you for your help with the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to update everyone on how much money we were able to raise through this lecture tonight. Um, so we raised a total of $183, which I am so excited about. Um, so great work, everyone. This is what can happen when we all come together and donate small amounts of money. So thank you guys so much. Um, this really just helps us kick off this new partnership that us, at, uh, us, uh, B. Willow has with the IUCN and the CSSG, which is the Cactus and Succulent Specialist Group, um, which we have a few members present today. Um, so yeah, we're just so excited to be able to kind of spread awareness to our audience of these highly important issues within uh, the world of conservation. So I really appreciate Jared's time. And it's really through Jared that we've been able to make these connections um, with members of the IUCN. So it's huge for us. It's definitely helping us achieve a lot of our environmental goals as a company. So we are highly appreciative of you, Jared. So thank you so much. Sorry, I also just, because someone asked, um, put my website and also my Twitter handle in the chat if people want. Um, and I can give people my um, email if they need to be in touch or want to be in touch about anything. Because um, I know we covered a lot and I probably talk too much, so. No, definitely not. <laughs> and yeah, so I've been recording this whole thing. So we will be um, putting it on our YouTube and putting it in various other places too for people to access if you wanted to rewatch or share it with anyone else. But yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, stay tuned. We're hopefully gonna be doing lectures on a monthly basis with different experts from around the globe. So we're super excited that we've finally kicked this off with Jared and yeah, stay tuned for more. Cool. Thanks a lot. Should I go ahead and end it? Yeah, go ahead and end it. <laughs> Bye.